All right, the drones are ready. Nice, now I can finally play the game. What game? Looks like somebody doesn't have a fourth wall. What is happening? Stalker is a series of three games, soon to be four. Developed by GSC Game World, the Stalker games have become cult classics amongst the respective communities, and just playing 15 minutes of it, you can very clearly see why. Well, good hunting, Stalker. Stalker is based off the book Roadside Picnic, written by two brothers Arkady and Bard Sturgatsky, and the sci-fi drama Tarkovsky Stalker, a Russian movie that is two and a half hours long. Speaking of which, <laughs> Tarkovsky Stalker is a slow, methodical movie that forces you to be immersed in every moment along with the characters. Now, a two and a half hour long movie that is incredibly slow and has shots that last a crazy long time might seem like torture. However, putting the audience on the same level as the characters actually nullifies the length of the movie through immersion in a way that you need to watch the movie to fully experience. Stalker is a movie about four characters. The guide, a stalker who is paid to take people into the zone. Writer, a depressed author who came into the zone looking for some kind of answer. And Professor, a physicist who wants to understand the zone and destroy the center of it to prevent it from getting in the wrong hands. The fourth character isn't actually a person, but a zone. The zone, specifically. The zone was created when, presumably, a meteor-like object fell and landed in the middle of a fictional USSR-like country. After sending in the military, who didn't come back, the government locked off the area. Naturally, rumors spread about the zone, one of which is that the center of the zone could grant any wish, which is mildly true. At the center of the zone is a place that will grant your innermost wish, and the only person we know to have gotten their wish granted is a man called Porcupine, who was the guide's mentor. Throughout the movie, the zone is characterized as this sporadic, unknowable entity that acts of its own accord, like a second version of nature. This personification of the zone makes the movie the masterpiece that it is. The zone, seemingly having a mind of its own and being an entity to be respected, makes every mistake made by the characters all the more tense, and paired with the incredible acting, you really get a grasp of what the characters are going through. Released in 1979 in Russia and 1982 in the States, only to be lambasted by the USSR State Committee for Cinematography. <laughs> Which... yeah, I can, I can see why. This movie is basically commentary on leaving Russia, something Tarkovsky would later do and end up not returning, unlike the guy in the movie. But what is this obscure 80s movie that actually killed people by shooting next to a paper processing plant that ended up poisoning people have to do with the problems in Stalker? I'm getting to that random audience member that I made up. So that's it? What, we some kind of suicide squad? Ludonarrative dissonance is a term coined by Clint Hawking, a game designer who worked on Watch Dogs Legion, Far Cry 2, the original Splinter Cell, and Splinter Cell Chaos Theory. To me, this is the craziest part about this, because it, this sounds like something an English or literature professor came up with in the 20th century. But nope, this is a term that was created in 2007, specifically talking about video games and for video games. Clint originally wrote about ludonarrative dissonance in a critique and blog post about the original Bioshock. Clint says that Bioshock's core ideas of critiquing Randian objectivism and the gameplay of Bioshock are at odds with how you progress and work your way through the story of Bioshock. The man who founded the setting for Bioshock, Andrew Ryan, is an objectivist and founded Rapture based off of these ideals. The player is given the choice throughout the game to either harvest power from the Little Sisters or to save them from being harvested by someone else. However, you as a player are taught to quote, literally seek power and you will progress, making the player want to harvest power from the Little Sisters. This forces you into playing under objectivist ideals. Gain what is best for me, I get more Adam, without consideration for others by harvesting little sisters. However, the player is also taught to follow Atlas's instructions to progress. Atlas is shown to be against Andrew Ryan throughout the story, obviously before the big twist, and Ryan's ideals of objectivism, which makes Atlas against your actions of objectivism, except he isn't as Atlas is one of your few allies throughout the entire game before the twist. This clashing of what is happening in the gameplay and what is happening in the story is called ludonarrative dissonance. 
Ludo comes from the word ludology, the study of games, referring to the gameplay of whatever game you're talking about. Narrative, referring to the story or narrative, and dissonance, meaning lack of harmony. Ludo narrative dissonance. Is it seared into your brain now? Get out of here, stalker! Stalker is an open-world sandbox game about surviving random encounters in the zone, where you follow a linear set of quests to complete your objective of killing Strelok. Ultimately, this is fun, engaging, and immerses you and brings you into the world, not unlike how Morrowind introduces you to its world through quest characters and environments. However, all of this world building is severely undermined in the ending. In the movie Stalker, I told you I'd get to this, Porcupine, the guide's mentor, hung himself after getting his innermost wish, which was to be rich. In the movie, you can't just say whatever you want and have that come true. Your innermost wish isn't figurative language, it's actually your innermost wish that comes true. Porcupine's wish was tragic because he had a family he cared about and wanted to help, and being rich wouldn't fix that. The guilt of not being able to help weighed so heavy on him he killed himself. The wish granting room wasn't necessarily sick or twisted. An unfortunate turn of events made the wish unintentionally harmful. The Stalker game does not handle the witch granter with nearly as much tact. In the game, the witch granter is deliberately sick and twisted, given each witch a monkey's paw. Wish to be immortal? You get turned into a statue, something that is neither living nor dead and therefore everlasting. Not only do the games handle wish granting more brazenly, the game suffers from ludonarrative dissonance because of it. If you have over 50,000 rubles, no matter what, you will get one of the non-canon bad endings. Strelik asks to be rich and then is buried in gold because of the twisted wish granter. This contradicts what the player wants. The player is conditioned to want, need, and collect money for everything from food to weapons and ammo, and by the end of the game you will have a bit of an excess of money as you probably already have the weapons and equipment you want slash need, and all the other equipment you have you've probably sold off resulting in more money, or you need to buy more ammo or food, which at that point may not be that damaging financially. However, the story and ending fate of Strelik contradicts this by giving the player one of what the community has dubbed false endings. This is especially detrimental to the game as, if you care about the story, the true or canon endings are really important to know more about the zone and what's happening in it. Another thing is, who cares? Why should I have less than 50,000 rubles? Why should I have to follow one very specific questline to get a true canon ending that ultimately, in an open world sandbox RPG that you're probably playing to experience the world around you, doesn't really matter? Making the player do certain things that certain characters tell you to do so you can progress the story in a certain way trivializes the point of the zone. Like I said earlier, the zone is characterized as this unknowable entity that acts of its own accord and will. This is not only true in the movie, but in the game with the sea consciousness. And if the zone is its own character, having other characters tell you how to walk through it through quests doesn't make sense, because you can't walk through a character like you can a world like Tamriel. You can experience and have interactions with the character, but it doesn't make sense to treat a character like the world. The zone isn't the world. The zone is part of the world. The worst part about this is that it seems easy to fix, although maybe it wasn't obvious back in 2007, or 2008, or 2009. And even if they did realize the problem and or the solution to the problem, they probably didn't have the time, experience, or approval to fix it. Uh, well, I... Ah, don't answer that. My society photographer got hit in the head by a polo ball. You're all I got. Big party for an American hero. My son, the astronaut. But could you pay me in advance? <laughs> you serious? Pay for what? Standing there? The planetarium tomorrow night, 8 o'clock. There's the door. GSC Game World was founded by Sergei Gagorovich in 1995, with their first game, Cossacks European Wars, being released on March 30th, 2001, in Europe and Russia, and the 24th of April in North America. With the unfortunate timing of being released a week before the original Black and White, the game was a massive hit in the UK, selling 100,000 units within the first week and going on to sell 500,000 units worldwide by December 2001. In November of 2001, GSC announced their new first-person shooter, Oblivion Lost, an action arena-style team-based FPS, this is actually how they marketed it, that boasted their new engine, the X-Ray engine. However, after the week sales of another one of the games, codenamed Outbreak, which was pretty much the same concept, the developers scrapped Build 1098 and looked to other Slavic inspiration. The book Roadside Picnic and its film counterpart Stalker were chosen for the game's inspiration, with the latter's name being used for the new game's title. 
supposedly taking place in Chernobyl after a second disaster made the Chernobyl exclusion zone the zone we know today. However, the team was apprehensive about the setting, worried that it might be in bad taste, but one trip to the real thing later, the game's setting was set in stone. Originally being set to release in 2003, Stalker Oblivion Lost morphed into the concept of Stalker that we know today. But by then, the release date of the game was fast approaching, and with nothing to show but a bunch of tech demos and tests in progress outside of basic ideas being painfully slow, with more and more ideas being piled onto the game, the game was set to enter development hell, with the name of the game being changed to Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. This had the unintentional effect of leading many people to think the game Stalker Oblivion Lost disappeared and became vaporware. Working conditions were also far less than ideal, as the part of Kiev the team was working in would fit into the world of Stalker perfectly, with low salaries to everyone but the most vital of employees. Lead designer of the game Andrew Porcroft described there being only four cars in the parking lot of a company that had close to 140 employees, three of which belonged to Sergei Grigorovich, the founder of the company. Matters were only made worse when in 2003, right after the game was set to release, a build of the game nowhere near finished was accidentally leaked from the inside because someone uploaded it to an FTP. Someone managed to accidentally upload a build of the game to an FTP. Enter Dean Sharp, a Californian who just had to close down his own studio, Big Eight Productions. After his friend, Jack Sorensen, executive vice president of Worldwide Studios at THQ, told the predicament that GSC was in over lunch and said that they needed someone to go to Ukraine to be, quote, THQ personified day in, day out, doing whatever it took to get the game done. Deed said yes sarcastically to the proposition, later saying, 90% of what Jack and I say to one another is sarcasm, so I just went along with it. By the end of our third bottle of wine, we had agreed that I was going to go check it out. So Sharp was unsurprisingly surprised when THQ asked for its passport details the next day. Dean's first visit was less than ideal, the translator having to tell everything he was saying, and with how the game was progressing, GSC wasn't exactly thrilled to have THQ breathing down their necks. Even after his second visit, feelings towards Dean hadn't sharpened, however, he knew what role he had to play, taking control of the project and saving it from disaster, with sounds great but save it for the sequel seemingly becoming a mantra for development. Axing anything that was unnecessary or needed too much time to come out good, the game was turned around and released in March of 2007. On top of being something that might have not even been on the table at the time in gaming in general, having many things axed could have ultimately hurt the game in the name of getting it out of development hell. And hey, with the way Shadow of Chernobyl turned out, I'm fine with that. But the solution seems so simple now. The solution to the problem is to make the story optional and dive headfirst into the survival sandbox elements of the Stalker open world. Luckily, some other fans of Stalker have also realized this. Stalker Call of Chernobyl, which is a very confusing title, is a mod made for Stalker Call of Pripyat that has been going on for quite a while now. This mod is pretty great, and provided you don't select any of the optional settings, you get a much more open experience. The open world is still intact, dynamic and random events still happen, factions are still just as dynamic, and the anomalies make the game even more unpredictable. However, what really makes this game, that is actually a mod, is customization and choice. You can choose from four extra modes, one of which is a story mode for those who want the original Stalker. You have more freedom of choice as well, being able to choose which faction you want to align with from the start of your game, even though we all know duty is the right option. The overall game is more free as well, with progression taking a more Breath of the Wild approach to exploration and progressing quests at your own pace. This isn't even taking into consideration all of the mods you can add as well, from changing the HUD, fixing damage problems, or just some nice quality of life changes. However, modding is this game's downfall, as to really get a great experience, you need a hefty chunk of mods and tweaks, so to me, this isn't the ideal way to play Stalker. However, there is one anomaly amongst the Stalker games. Stalker Anomaly is the best way to play Stalker in my opinion. Running on its own custom 64-bit fork of the X-Ray engine, Stalker Anomaly is not only free but completely standalone, meaning if you don't own any of the Stalker games, you can still play it. 
Anomaly comes right out with the majority of the fixes that Call of Chernobyl needed to download separately, even fixing the wonky damage that plagued Stalker even on higher difficulties. A majority of these fixes can even be tweaked and messed with with the absolutely insane settings menu that has options for almost every part of visuals, audio, and gameplay. Choosing how you want to start is carried over from Call of Chernobyl with even more settings to play with, and a starting loadout selector with a point system very similar in effect to Classic Fallout. New options for modes have been added, adding one of the best additions to the sandbox mode, Warfare, a mode dedicated to shaping the world around faction relations and who has control over territory. The sandbox is even better than Call of Chernobyl, making quests even more optional than before, and paired with Warfare, interactions in the zone and firefights are even more interesting and important. Combat is even more intense than before, with the addition of having a chance to bleed when you get shot and being affected by radiation from the hostile wildlife and the hostile environment. Environment. There still are some issues with Anomaly, mostly carried over from the Stalker series in general. For one, it's still running on the X-Ray engine, which is bound together with duct tape and the hopes and dreams of irradiated Ukrainian children. While it is pretty unrealistic for a small group of fans to remake the game in another engine, even with the 64-bit fork of the X-Ray engine, the game still has some pretty bad memory issues. Some of the models are definitely lower quality than others, but I think that's an issue with the version of Stalker they based the game off of and not with Anomaly itself. However, overall this is 100% the best way to play Stalker, I think. Being able to choose between all the different modes with all of the great options right out of the box is well worth the 12 gigabytes it takes up on your hard drive. And if you're someone who doesn't know if Stalker is for them, which is fair, Anomaly is completely free and you can play it without owning any of the other games. <coughs> Stalker quickly became one of my favorite concepts for a game, and after watching the movie, playing the games, and the mods, and the standalones, it became one of my favorite series. The Zone is an endlessly fascinating place to me and is consistently entertaining and terrifying. And despite its problems, Stalker has really big potential and I'm excited for the upcoming Stalker 2, which is a weird name because it's really the fourth in the series. I hope Stalker 2 doesn't dumb down anything to reach a bigger audience because you're never going to appeal to everyone with these games. I also hope they embrace the survival aspects, however if they refine and implement the quests well enough I think it could really work. All they need to do is not overhype and overpromise the game, and at the very least it will release positive critical reception. Is this some kind of metaphor for what's happening on Earth? No. I don't understand. Do you need me to recap the video? No, forget it. Alright. Up next on the list is Skyrim. I would rather play modern Call of Duty than give in to your peer pressure. Alright, Call of Duty it is. No, that's not what I meant.